Well, welcome everyone. I'm Rick Hassan of UC Irvine School of Law and co-director of the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. I wanna welcome you to uh, today's uh, conversation uh, about the new book by E.J. Dion and Miles Rappaport called, um, I'll hold it up, I've got my visual aid, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. I urge you to go and read it. Let me um, introduce our uh, two authors and speakers today and our moderator. E.J. Dion is Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, university professor at Georgetown University, and a visiting professor at Harvard University. He is also the author of Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite and Save Our Country. Miles Rappaport is Senior Practice Fellow in American Democracy at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard's Kennedy School. He formerly served in the Connecticut State Legislature and as Connecticut Secretary of State. He also served as President of Demos and Common Cause. Our moderator today is my UCI colleague, Sarah Wallace Goodman. She's an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. Her research examines democratic citizenship and shaping of political identity through immigrant integration. She's the author of Citizenship in Hard Times, How Ordinary People Respond to Democratic Threat and the forthcoming Pandemic Politics, and uh, the author of Immigration and Membership Politics in Western Europe. Very um, accomplished group here of book writers. Um, so glad to have all of you. If you have questions for uh, our authors today, uh, the chat function will not work for you, but the Q&A box will work. So please type your questions in the Q&A box. Keep them brief so that uh, Sarah can read them and be able to read them out and keep them questions. Uh, thank you all. And let me turn it over to Sarah. And thanks to all of you for attending. Thank you, Rick. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, EJ and Miles, for participating in this um, discussion today. Um, and thank you for sending me your book. I love books. Um, and I really enjoyed reading this. It's a really bold idea. And I look forward to this hour uh, discussing with you. Uh, these, this big idea with you. Um, let's get started about why. Uh, EJ, let me start with you. Uh, why did you decide to write this book? I mean, this is a precarious time for democracy. There are problems everywhere. Why start with universal voting? And you're on mute. I, I said before that I said before that I love the one good thing about the pandemic. It's the only time in my life where anybody has told me unmute yourself. So. Uh, good to be here. I want to thank Rick for having us. Rick produces good and important books at around the same pace. I write newspaper columns, uh, and they are important <laughs> books. And uh, I usually agree with Rick. And even when I don't, I learn an immense amount. And Sarah, I can't wait to read Pandemic Politics. Um, that sounds like an awesome book. Um, we, well, we, we each have a different path, uh, Miles and I, have got to the same place. And since people often ask this of co-authors, it was a lot of fun to work with Miles. We really enjoyed this entire process from the working group that we put together to vet this idea and to put out a report to producing the book um, itself. Um, I came to this in a sense for two reasons. I've been for this for a long time. My colleague, Bill Galston at the Brookings Institution and I uh, wrote a paper uh, back in 2015 calling for universal voting uh, and laying out an early version of uh, this proposal. Uh, I am attracted to it because I have, uh, by a happy uh, circumstance, um, have had uh, spent a lot of time in Australia and watched Australian politics and watched this system work incredibly well uh, to draw people in the electorate and to create a culture of participation. And in my newspaper column life, I have been deeply upset for a long time about efforts at voter suppression uh, in the United States, efforts to roll back the advances that we have made um, in uh, voting rights, uh, you know, culminating in the, the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, and universal voting, universal civic duty voting, struck me as the best way to combat a voter suppression directly, because the best way to defend voting as a right uh, is to assert and insist upon the duty to vote. With this system, it becomes incumbent 
on everyone who is writing election law or running an electoral system uh, to make it as easy as possible to do something that we have declared uh, a civic legal uh, duty. Um, what we've seen in Australia is that you begin to change the culture of politics when you change the rules of politics. That's an allusion to an old line uh, from Daniel Patrick Moynihan. In Australia, there is a culture of participation. Um, those who are non-voters elsewhere engage in politics. I like this idea because democracy elections are no longer like an elite dinner party where there is an A list of likely voters and B and C lists who are utterly ignored by politicians uh, and political uh, consultants. Um, that's for starters, and we will describe it in more detail. Um, but I really do think that or this could be the game changing idea uh, that ends the voting wars and breaks our gridlock over this. I'm still for, as Miles is, the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. But I think by having everybody in the system, uh, we will have far less contention and more attention to the issues at stake in every election. Thank you. Sarah, if I, EJ sort of invited me, I think, to say, well, how did I get to this since we came by different paths? And my uh, uh, answer is that I have really for the last 40 years, whether as a legislator or uh, as secretary of the state in Connecticut or as the president of Demos and Common Cause, worked on issues to open up the voting process to make it more <laughs> accessible and encourage a wider electorate. And I believe that those reforms that we've worked for uh, work. I think they have upped the level of turnout. They're certainly being resisted powerfully enough in some quarters to make us think that they, that they do matter. But after all that time uh, of feeling like we've moved the needle uh, by same day voter registration, by restoring voting rights to people with felony convictions, by, in some, by having online voter registration, by expanding mail-in voting and early voting, all those things I think matter. We've moved the needle, but really not very much. The 2020 elections and 2018 elections, the midterms, were both record-breaking turnouts for the United States. But that meant 66 point something percent uh, in the presidential election and just about 50% in the midterms. And that's really nothing to write home about. So both EJ and I started to think about uh, what is it that could really, really move the needle and discover that in some places, 25 around the world, but including Australia, which has had it for 100 years, by making voting an expectation and a requirement of citizenship, they get 90% turnout in every election. And it seems to me that that would be a really, really good thing for American democracy. So you, you're both talking about kind of different problems, voter suppression, low turnout, and that both of these problems can be solved with this kind of institutional fix, right? And you both kind of have this strong belief that institutions create the norms, that if you make the rule, the norms will follow. This is a really important kind of uh, belief that underscores the argument. Um, and I, I thought a lot about it as I'm reading the book about how you if, if creating buy-in to change the rules is one thing, how do you cultivate the norms that follow? And I think a lot of the comparisons to Australia uh, help us think through that. Um, maybe you could describe uh, for us and for the audience kind of how Australia works, how, you know, a hundred years ago, they changed this rule, why they changed this rule and kind of what the cultural, um, how, how a, cult uh, a culture of citizenship was cultivated after this rule change. Well, you know, it was fun to go into the history of it because as history always is, the history of this is contested in Australia. Uh, but as best, you know, there's a kind of pure civics version that says the leaders of the country were unhappy at low turnout. So everybody agreed that they would have this system. Uh, in fact, as is often true in politics, the story was more complicated. Um, the push for universal voting for a voting requirement came from the conservative side of politics. Uh, because the conservatives were worried about the Labor Party and the, the power of the trade union movement. And many conservatives were worried because that because the unions were so well organized, labor would dominate elections. And so they proposed uh, universal voting that would bring everybody in. 
But labor quite shrewdly looked at this system and said, no, we think this will be good for us too. Um, and I think as we uh, argue for this going forward, um, I would make the case that this should not be seen as a system that is designed to benefit uh, one party or uh, the other, because I think it would bring in different kinds of people into the electorate that each side might uh, uh, want to bring in. And it would also bring in a lot of people whose views are not as ideological as those of uh, the electorate as a whole, which would probably create a more moderate electorate uh, on the whole. Um, the Australian system works because they have done all the work to bring everyone into the electorate through universal voter registration. Government plays a big role in making sure everyone's on the roll, though you have a legal obligation uh, to vote. The Australian system works because it's a light touch uh, enforcement, a phrase I've uh, learned from Miles, um, where uh, this is not heavy duty, heavy handed government. Um, if you don't vote, you get a notice from the government. Uh, the fine maximum is uh, right around, I think at current exchange rates is around $14. Uh, in our proposal, we set it at uh, $20. Uh, but if you offer any sort of reasonable excuse, you don't pay the fine. Uh, I believe the last time I checked the numbers, only 13% of non-voters um, ever had to pay the fine. So again, the system is built on, um, uh, on the idea of uh, an expectation to vote, not uh, for the purpose of punishing people. Um, but what they've done is, and then they also have election day on a Saturday, which means they can use every school in the country to close. I am not partial to a particular day of the week, although I do think um, having voting on a national holiday, making voting day a national holiday would be a good idea. You can vote early, you can vote by mail, you can cast your ballot anywhere in the country. They have a very easy system uh, for voting. And the last thing I'll say is the result is that, as a voter told the New York Times a few years ago, election day is like a party in Australia. Um, at every polling place, uh, there are all kinds of civic groups selling food and the like. Uh, uh, the most popular item are democracy sausages. Uh, and um, we suggest uh, that if we, in our system, we would love vegan alternatives for those who wanted uh, vegan alternatives. But the election day is a cause for celebrating freedom in Australia. And while I think there is always an interaction between culture and the law, law and culture, I think there are cases, and I'm glad you raised that interesting question that's a sort of large philosophical question, really. Um, but I think this is a case where we have very solid evidence from Australia, from Uruguay, and from a number of other countries um, that the system you adopt really can change the culture of democracy for the better. And uh, I think the Australian case, which we dwell on because a lot of Americans can relate very easily to Australia uh, and because it's really the oldest system of this sort in the world. And lastly, because we've gotten other ideas like the secret ballot from Australia before, so why not this one? <laughs> right. Um, so, I will say as a political science, I can't help but dabble in the philosophical. Um, but good. also <laughs> there is an irony that, you know, the US has so many holidays dedicated to our civic culture, but voting day is not one of them, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, Australia is a great example of the implementation of universal civic, you call it universal civic duty voting. Um, and Belgium is another example. But you know, Canada is a really interesting example that you bring up in the book where they discussed it and then decided not to implement it. Uh, so I wonder if you could um, share with us kind of some of the significant opposition that maybe you saw in that case, but also that you identify in the book as kind of these, these you know, some of the major um, arguments against uh, adopting this policy. You, you know, one example is the libertarian uh, objection, and there are others that you detail. I'm wondering if you could walk uh, the audience through those objections. Miles, well, go ahead. I, sure, I'll just, I'll just say quickly that the, it was a close call in Canada. Uh, there was a, a commission that studied it very carefully, actually recommended uh, that Canada adopt universal voting, but uh, in the end, it was not adopted. And interestingly enough, uh, there's another example, which is Chile, uh, where it, they had it for a while and it was uh, uh, you know, repealed 
And it looks very likely that in the new constitutional convention uh, that Chile is having, that it will be readopted. So uh, this is something that, uh, you know, uh, we think it's an idea that has proof of proof of concept, as EJ says, you know, in Australia, and we think it's worth doing it. But the art, the art we, we absolutely understand that we'll face opposition. Uh, I'll start with the libertarian argument that you uh, referenced, Sarah. Um, and that is that any kind of form of compulsion requires the strictest of scrutiny, so to speak. Um, and, you know, the truth is uh, there are many, many things that we as a society decide are requirements for people to do, whether it's paying taxes or educating your children or a wide variety of other things. But the most analogous clearly uh, is jury duty. And for the same reason, uh, you know, we have part as part of our culture and nobody says, gee, this is a horrible compulsion uh, that I have to do, that everyone is required to serve on a jury, jury if they're called. And the reason is because we want everyone to be judged by a representative uh, grouping of their peers, so to speak, that we have the fullest representation and it isn't just one kind of person or another kind of person that serves on juries. We think the analogy to voting is very, very close, which is that we should want that everyone in our society, a fully representative sample, makes the decisions about what, what the laws are that we're gonna govern ourselves under and of the people who are gonna make those decisions. So we feel like if you just expand jury duty in your mind and think about it as it applies to voting, uh, it makes a lot of sense. We did look at two other objections that I think are, are you know gave us a concern. One is from uh, people in the African-American and in the civil rights community that somehow even a small fine will end up as a larger burden on poor citizens, on communities of color that don't have the resources. And, you know, as we saw, unfortunately, tragically in Ferguson, you know, where people were fined small fines and then they were uh, compounded with interest and penalties and before long, people found themselves in a, in a, in a lot of trouble. So our recommendation, so we thought about that and we talked very uh, carefully with uh, uh, leaders in the voting rights community. Uh, that it's a very small fine, as EJ said, about $20. I, by the way, all this is just our recommendation. Um, in any place where this is going to be adopted, the legislators or the city councilors or whoever, they would make the actual determination on exactly how it would work. But our recommendation is that it should be a small fine. It should not have any compounding interest, no penalties, and never be the subject of a criminal warrant. The uh, corollary is that what about people who are non-citizens, people who are immigrants, for instance, um, you know, who are then told you must vote, you must vote, you must vote, and then they vote and find out that they have voted illegally. And so it's also really important for legislation to be careful, to be drawn in such a way that inadvertent violations like that do not uh, get people. But I think the biggest attack we're going to get is from the conservatives who really, um, you know, uh, are going to say that people should not have a right not to vote. And we had good, really good constitutional lawyers who told us that, the, who studied this very carefully and said that we think that this will absolutely pass constitutional muster. It's not compelled speech. Uh, it is participation and you can do it in any form that you like. And just to elaborate on that, just for a moment, um, we are very careful to note as in Australia uh, that you are not compelled to vote for a candidate. Um, you know, if the ballot was Sarah and Rick and we wanted to vote for both and didn't want to choose, we could leave it blank uh, if we wanted. Uh, you can draw a Mickey Mouse on your ballot. You can scrawl an obscenity on your ballot. You can do anything you want. And just to underscore that it's not compelled speech, we propose that if this system were adopted, uh, there should be a none of the above option uh, on the ballot. Um, the other thing in good American fashion, inspired by the uh, selective service system, uh, we provide for a conscientious subjector status. You can apply early on and uh, you know, uh, get out of this requirement. Um, and we'd have a fairly permissive conscientious subjector uh, status. Again, we're trying to underscore here that the penalty is not the point, but the existence of the small penalty of getting that little mailer from your state or locality, if you didn't vote, um, is a way of creating uh, the culture of participation. Um, a last quick point, if I may, you could, we try to be very honest in this book. So we did polling that shows right now, the vast majority of Americans oppose uh, our idea, opposes our idea that uh, our own polling showed 
that about 26% of Americans support it, which we actually thought was pretty good for an idea that's new and has never been argued for in a systematic way. About 49% of Americans, 48% are strongly opposed, um, which leaves another quarter uh, where there's room to um, uh, persuade. And we looked at the objections people had and we try to answer them directly in the book. Uh, but the other polling question that we asked, thanks to the Democracy Fund on a survey that they were doing, um, it, uh, showed that people do agree with our underlying premise. That we asked, do you see uh, voting as uh, right, a duty, both or neither? And 61% of Americans see voting as both a right and a duty. And that's our core assertion behind this idea. That's right. You know, when I um, teach citizenship to undergrads and I ask them, what are the rights of being an American citizen and what are the duties of American citizen? And, you know, and, and they think, well, jury duty. And then like their, their mind kind of stops and, and we engage in this very question about well, what is it that you know would make you think that it's your duty to vote? And what I like about the model that you provide is you have the opportunity to spoil a ballot. You have the opportunity to conscientiously object, but that those are affirmative actions that you have to take as opposed to defaulting to those kind of opting out uh, behaviors. Um, so you mentioned fines and fees. Thank you for putting it that way, by oh. the way. Yeah, they, uh, we, we got to get Cass Sunstein to endorse this. Yeah, idea. exactly. <laughs> Little nudges. Um, yeah. That, you know, so fines and fees is kind of one objection. You can talk a lot about kind of the partisan objection. So I think that that's kind of an elephant in the room here. Are we just thinking about uh, universal voting as just helping Democrats? So when we think about, um, you know, voting in the last election and the, the kind of the references that Trump would make to the effect of um, mail-in ballots, and that's how Republicans lose, right? How is this so can you frame for us the objection that this only helps Democrats and kind of what Republicans need, what what kind of convincing do they need? Like what kind of evidence do you think that would pers persuade Republicans out there to say this benefits us as well? Why don't you go Miles and I'll just go back to the polling at the end uh, because we, we were very interested in this for obvious reasons. Go ahead Miles, you, why don't you start? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. And I think that uh, 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 EJ and I and many others really approach this from the point of view of what is the best for democracy with a small D? Um, and what are the implications going to be, uh, uh, you know, for the, for the partisans was a secondary question. Uh, that said, obviously, it's a, it will be part of the conversation. We don't think that it is a given that this will help the Democrats and only the Democrats. There's no question that the current electorate uh, is skewed in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, the, the kind of the shorthand version is that it is older, richer, whiter, and more educated than the population as a whole. Um, and so there's no question that young people, uh, uh, people who are less uh, educated, poorer people, uh, people in communities of color who have historically had lower voting rights, although in the African American community that's getting quite close, um, you know, they will vote more. But it is also the case that rural, white, uh, less educated people who were largely Trump voters in 2020 will also come out in larger numbers. And the truth is that in the 2020 elections, we saw many, many different uh, um, directions and vectors of how people who didn't vote before, but who did vote in this large scale election uh, voted. So we don't think it's a given uh, and we don't think it matters. Uh, I think our commitment to this is to democracy. And we think that a fully reflective democracy is really what we want. I think as I'll, I'll steal EJ's line before he says it, uh, that when the founder said we want to be uh, a country based on the consent of the governed, uh, although they didn't always live up to this, I don't think they meant some of the governed or 66% of the governed. We think it should mean all of the consent of all of the governed and that everybody should participate in this fundamental uh, responsibility of self-government. Uh, thank you, by the way, for somebody who just posted in the chat uh, a piece in the post that uh, summarizes our book that's up now. Uh, bless you for that. Um, our, it was interesting because the polling we did was at the beginning of the 2020 election. And so it was before all of these issues were hyper politicized by Trump. 
Um, what was fascinating is that uh, when you looked at party, um, you found that um, Democrats and Republicans alike were equally inclined to see voting as both a right and a duty, 69% each. And that support for this idea was higher among Democrats, but not by much. 33% uh, among Democrats, 29% among Republicans. Um, there was more of an ideological split. The only group uh, in the country where there's already a majority uh, support for this idea were people who describe themselves as very liberal, where 51% uh, supported the idea. Um, so before you had all of this controversy in uh, 2020, which will not make our task easier, unfortunately, um, you did have uh, a fair number of Republicans, and, and certainly on the civic duty side, a lot of conservatives uh, who were open to arguments about this. Um, but we do think it's important to make the case that uh, this idea would not automatically benefit the left or Democrats. Um, Australia, uh, conservatives have won more recent elections uh, in Australia than the Labor Party has, uh, the, you know, the, the conservative coalition uh, down there. Um, we think that if you compare 2018 to 2020 and ask yourself, why did Democrats lose seats in the House? Um, it's because there was a big surge of voting among white working class voters uh, in 2020. So I do think, and this probably benefits the Democrats some, that one of the other effects of it is, um, and Miles suggested this, it will bring out more younger voters. Um, but on the whole, um, I think we can make the case, we are not making this case because for a partisan purpose, and we can make a case that uh, you know left and right conservatives and liberals and moderates can do just fine in this system. I like the idea of trying to craft a system that engages more people, particularly younger voters. Um, you know, I study civic education and, you know, thinking through you know, some of the implications of this, you know, change. I'm wondering if you have any ideas about, you know, once, you know, once you change the norm, once you change the rule and the norms, how, like what kind of civic education gets people excited about voting? I mean, it's one thing to have an obligation for it, but like, we want people to want to vote too. I think that's part of democracy as well. well let me just throw up my favorite soundbite, which poor Miles is gonna hear a lot in the coming month or so <laughs> as we, uh, um, but um, I sort of analogize our current election system to a, an exclusive dinner party where there is an A-list of likely voters. And that A-list gets all the attention from campaigns, all the attention from politicians, all the attention from the political consultants um, and very little effort is put into uh, uh, informing, uh, making a case to or turning out the B and C list of less likely voters. And so if you change the system where number one politicians will no longer have an interest in suppressing the other side's vote, which is also a characteristic of our system because everybody's in, um, will no longer have an interest in concentrating just on one little piece of the electorate, again, because everybody's in, um, then voters who have been ignored by the system are suddenly being paid attention to. Uh, politicians are visiting with them. They are getting campaign literature. They are getting emails. So they are being contacted through in, in all sorts of ways. And so that alone just starts pulling people into the electoral system. The second quick thing is um, um, one of the people we interviewed is Kim Beasley down in Australia, who used to be the leader of the Labor Party and was the Australian ambassador to the US. He's been involved in politics since he was a kid because his dad was also a politician. And he said that when he stood at the polls giving out cards for the Labor Party, um, he had a very strong sense that voters who might not be there without the compulsory voting took what they were doing very seriously. Um, and it doesn't mean they were as immersed as the hyper-political were. Um, it doesn't, however, that doesn't mean that they weren't as informed uh, and they took what they did very seriously. So I think if we say to everybody, we care about your opinion enough to think that everybody should participate, it creates a culture to pull people in. I think that's right. 
please, Miles, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add, I was glad to hear you raise the issue, Sarah, of the uh, of civic education, because I think, and this goes back to your question of what, is it the norms, is it the culture, is it the laws uh, that lead? And of course, I think it's a kind of a, a, a vicious or perhaps a virtuous cycle. Um, but I think that if, if, if it were the expectation that every 18 year old had a, a responsibility to vote, a requirement to vote, um, if I were the principal of a school or a superintendent of a school system, would that make me want to emphasize civic education more? I absolutely think it would. I think it would be incumbent upon us to make sure that the kids who are graduating were able to fulfill their legal responsibilities to vote. If I were an employer or a, you know, whether it, an institution or a company, and I knew that every one of my employees were required to vote, would that make me more likely to give them the time off to do so? I think it would. So I think what you'd see is that, you know, the institution of society, the schools, the, the employers, the civil society organizations, community organizations would adapt themselves and move themselves and shift themselves to really make voting a part of what they talk about and, a, and, a, and to, to enable everyone to fulfill their responsibilities. And I think that would be uh, a healthy thing. And I'll just want to put a little um, visual imagery behind what, what EJ was saying about the dinner party list. Um, I was a candidate uh, 11 times altogether uh, for state legislature and for secretary of the state. And I did a lot of door knocking and a lot of going through neighborhoods. And each time I went, I was given a list of the likely voters and told, these are the only people on this street that you're supposed to talk to. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. And so I would actually pass families who were sitting out on the stoop, but I wouldn't talk to them because I knew that they were likely not going to vote turn that incentive system on its head. If I think if everyone is going to vote, I'm going to talk to everyone. And I think what would happen is that the parties and the campaigns, rather than simply churning out their own uh, 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 base, somebody used the phrase enrage to engage, um, you know, and worse, even worse, you know, try to depress the or suppress the vote of your opponent, uh, you know, you've got to direct your uh, message to everybody. Everybody's listening. Everybody's going to vote. And I think that would help moderate our politics to some degree, but in any case, make it more about persuading the whole public. By the way, you know, I've known Miles now for quite a while and have worked with him. I can't believe he actually passed those people by knowing his personality. I can't imagine his campaign aides tugging him away and pushing him toward those likely voters. But anyway, just, just had to say that. And metaphorically <laughs> speaking, that was right. <laughs> you only have so much time on the campaign trail, right? Um, you know, I think I think you both get it exactly right. I think young people are very excited about politics. They have, you know, issues like climate change or student loan or um, transgender equality, that they're issues that they really care about. They're just not very excited about partisan politics, right? And so I can imagine how a universal civic duty to vote alters the incentives for parties to, you know, um, you know, change their kind of campaign approach, as you talk about in the book, uh, produces this uh, anticipated effect of political moderation, potentially. Um, I was curious if you could think about kind of other consequences or maybe externalities that would result from this. I'm thinking about gerrymandering. I'm thinking about if there then becomes a different incentive to kind of change what districts look like if you then know that everyone has the, the obligation to vote. Do you imagine that that could be a consequence of this change? You know, one of the things we say in the book at the end is we don't see this as a uh, an elixir that cures everything that ails you. Uh, and we go out of our way to talk about some of these problems like gerrymandering and like our campaign finance system. And if you want to go beyond that, the Electoral College, the unrepresented nature of the Senate, there are all kinds of issues in our electoral system. And we don't want to pretend that this one big reform, it, we think it would change the civic culture in hugely important ways. We don't necessarily think it will solve every uh, problem, but I, I do think that um, if you have an electorate that it does include everybody and everybody has a stake in the outcome, uh, I think you would have more citizens concerned about a lot of other structural reforms. Uh, we argue that this is the reform that could underwrite other reforms, but we would never pretend that you don't need other reforms as well. Right. I mean, so there's lots of problems, 
Let's imagine that this is the one we pick first. Let's move from these kind of description, you know, items of, of how it works to implementing it. How do we get this done? Who do we need to convince first? Well, you know, the, uh, uh, one of the chapters in the in the book is about at what barrier, what would need to happen at various levels of government in order to implement this. And it's absolutely clear that the federal government, the Congress, uh, could enact uh, universal voting, you know, for all federal elections. Uh, we are, we think that's unlikely, um, and we're not totally naive about uh, about how politics works. But we also think that it is very possible that states and even municipalities, kind of in their role as laboratories of democracy, would be the first kind of takers, the first movers on a on a reform like this. So I think what we have to do is, uh, you know, what is a threefold strategy, if you will, you know, in order to try to move this. One is to really just, you know, as we're doing today with you, and thank you for helping us get the idea out into the public domain, get people on uh, on campuses and journalists uh, just talking about it and thinking about it, uh, and and not having it be something that's a completely off of the table discussion, uh, which it has been for a very very long time. Secondly, I think there is a kind of robust movement of, of people who are working on voting rights issues and uh, you know, getting those organizations and people in those positions to kind of think about this. Not again, not in contradiction to expanding voter registration or expanding mail voting or things like that, but rather you know, a kind of a North Star of what is it that we really, really want. And what we really, really want is full participation of everyone and in a fully inclusive and fully representative way. And then the, the last thing will be that we hopefully, um, you know, state legislators and city councilors who see the value of a full and fully inclusive democracy will put this legislation in. Uh, it has been introduced in, in both in Connecticut and in Massachusetts. And I think come 2023, you'll see it introduced in a number of places. Uh, it will certainly get opposition, but there'll be public hearings. There'll be um, op-eds written about it for and against. And we think that will all be a really, really healthy debate. But we're going to have to persuade both uh, citizens um, and, and people in political office that this is something that we should really want to do. And I think we can. I just want to say one of the bills was introduced by a former student of mine, a state senator named Will Haskell in Connecticut. I don't think it's because he's my former student, but I love him dearly. And I was grateful that he introduced the bill. And it's one of the it's an appendix to our book to show this is real. This is out there. This is in a state legislature and it's a start. <laughs> you have to be the idea entrepreneurs and put it out there and be vocal and then hopefully the hope is, I guess, legislatures pick it up, right? And, and legislators pick it up and move the ball forward. Yes, right. exactly. That's right. Um, thank you so much for engaging with my questions. I'm going to take this opportunity now to pivot to the Q&A from our audience. We have a lot of questions here. Um, I will attempt to sort through them efficiently. Uh, so please bear with me as I do. Uh, first question comes from, a former high school classmate to EJ, Chris Kobe from Portland, Oregon. Oh, hey, so <laughs> nice of you to join. Hello. <laughs> he writes, please discuss the different values inherent in each of your alternative proposals of allowing persons to cast blank ballots uh, or vote for none of the above. Well, there are, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the, the most important from our point of view in terms of uh, having this idea pass constitutional muster uh, is uh, thanks to the work of a wonderful group of lawyers. Let me just shout them out right now uh, who helped on the legal chapter of the book, uh, Allegra Chapman, uh, Josh Douglas, who's an academic, who's a political scientist, Cecily Hines, Brenda White, uh, Wright, uh, Cornell William Brooks, the former head of the NAACP, and Janae Nelson, uh, who now heads the uh, Legal Defense Fund, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, were also very involved in this. We honor them here. But uh, when you look at the case law, um, if someone were compelled to make a choice, uh, it would be reasonable for courts to interpret that as compelled speech, and therefore they would throw the whole idea out. Uh, so our primary purpose is uh, to um, make sure we're not compelling speech, but only behavior. 
But there is a secondary legitimate libertarian concern um, that if you don't like any of the candidates on the ballot, uh, there's no law that should tell you you have to vote for any of those candidates. And so uh, just as there are write-in votes uh, right now in many uh, states, and you could do that too, um, you know, there's also the opportunity to cast a blank ballot or to skip a race. I have, uh, I am uh, deeply political, and on a couple of occasions in my life, low, on lower level offices, where I really didn't like either candidate very much, I skipped the race, and it was my own statement about that particular choice. I never did that in a high level race. Uh, that's your right too, and that's in Massachusetts. Actually, they count all those and they call them blanks. Uh, and uh, I remember somebody only among political junkies would you get the question, did you blank the treasurer's race? Uh, but that's an affirmative action and that should be permitted in a democratic, uh, uh, in a democratic system. Um, so that I, there are, there's the legal reason and there is, I think, a legitimate philosophical desire not to force anybody to vote for anybody they don't want to vote for. Um. We have a question uh, from my colleague, uh, Carol Ulaner, who writes, election security has been misrepresented as a problem, but nonetheless, there are real issues in making elections secure. How do you think universal voting would affect this, either easing or making it more complicated to prevent bad behavior? Well, you know, I think one of the, I, I, I mentioned before that a variety of institutions would you know, kind of move themselves, adapt themselves to this new uh, set of requirements. I think one of those is the, is the field of election administration. I mean, right now we have, um, you know, we have a brand new problem, which is the attack and assaults on election administrators and on nonpartisan election administration, you know, in and of itself. But even before that, um, you know, election administration was underfunded. Uh, it was seen as an afterthought by the by many states and municipalities with stretched budgets. The federal government never supplied anywhere near the kind of funding that it should. So I think if you have a situation where everyone is gonna vote and turnout is gonna increase, we need to fund uh, election administration. We need to do the kind of training and support for election administrators that they deserve, um, protecting them against, uh, against attack. Um, so, I, I also think that it is, it, you know, you would see some real attention to the issues of uh, how do we make sure that the voter lists are accurate. Uh, if everyone on the voting list is required to vote, I think, you know, keeping those lists straight, clean, up to date, I think is an important thing. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of uh, back and forth on the voter ID uh, issue. I think there are actually ways to do voter ID that are not, you know, kind of oppressive or suppressive of the vote. So I think uh, generally, I think just upping the whole level of professionalism of election administration, funding election administration would be a really, really important thing to do. And we go very close, very well to assuage to the extent that they aren't just, uh, you know, made up issues, assuage the concerns that people have about voting security. Yeah, I'm glad Miles mentioned voter ID because why are... Um supporters of voting rights critical of some forms of voter ID. It's because those forms of voter ID are being used to suppress certain votes. Uh, you know, we know, for example, that if you live in these suburbs, getting a driver's license is a normal part of your life because you got to have a car to get around. Uh, there are a lot of people in inner city neighborhoods who don't have cars, don't have driver's licenses. So if the, only the license can be used as an ID, you're already creating a whole new a requirement on people who otherwise wouldn't get this driver's license. Meanwhile, the suburbanite gets it as a matter of course. Um, but the objection is if, if, uh, if ID was not being used uh, as a form of suppression, the other fun story, by the way, is in Texas, you could use your uh, concealed carry permit, but not your state issued ID at the University of Texas. Uh, wonder who that favors and who that doesn't uh, favor. Um, you know, if the if the issue were neutral because everybody's going to vote, you could find, I think, a consensus on what forms of ID might be acceptable if this is an issue that really concerns a lot of people. And so I think we could shove away a bunch of the issues that are now either excuses for false arguments or legitimate concerns among some people about the potential for fraud. 
There's a question in here that kind of follows up from that statement. How do you prevent kind of put, uh, partisan electoral commissions or um, kind of nefarious actors at the local level from still uh, trying to suppress voters, even with this universal standard? Well, you could argue it almost becomes against, uh, Ralph Nader once said he likes, he's a supporter of this idea. And he said it becomes against the, it becomes a violation of the law to suppress the vote because you're blocking people from doing uh, their civic duty. I don't know uh, if that would work. I do think physically restraining somebody from voting is a violation of the law, but not election law, uh, but other kinds of uh, law. Rick, the lawyer can help us on this. Um, but um, I, I think that uh, you, you kind of almost bypass that issue because you're saying everybody is going to vote as a matter of duty and a matter of right. Uh, and, um, the, and so I think you obviate a lot of those uh, problems. I'm curious what uh, Miles, I learned by the way, in doing this book that Connecticut's the only state where the secretary of state is actually called secretary of the state. So let me ask my former secretary of the state to take that one. <laughs> My friend, <laughs> the nutmeggers are very concerned about that. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think the 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 question points to a different problem. I want to go back to something EJ said earlier, which is that we don't uh, uh, make the argument that if we simply did this requirement to vote, then that would solve all the problems. We have a major issue in the question of how election administration is run. Um, you know, they are uh, in almost all the other kind of major industrialized countries, um, you know, elect the election, there is a national electoral commission. It is nonpartisan, it is professionally run, it is a part of the civil service. We're sort of alone in having kind of partisan elected officials do also the election administration. And I was one, so I know that there are real pressures um, for uh, and whether you're a party loyalist or whether you're a professional election administrator. So I think um, removing to the extent that we can election administration from partisanship overall, you can never fully remove it, but I think we can you know, do a lot. Funding election administration uh, properly, elevating the pay for election administrators and election workers uh, as well. There are a lot of things that we could do that would make election administration a whole lot better and would relieve uh, you know, some of the some of the worries that people have. If you didn't have an elected secretary of the state as the chief election official, you, you wouldn't have people running for the position who are just doing it to try to advance, advantage their own party. You talk about some of these and other reforms as these gateway reforms in the book uh, that you can't just change this rule. There needs to be complementary legislation around this change that just sort of enables the establishment of this new practice. Um, By the way, but, could I just shout please, out what well, um, the bipartisan commission that President Obama appointed um, that was, um, uh, I'm trying to remember that, that, that it was a very partisan co-chairs on each side. Two Bob, Bauer, Bob Bauer and Ben, Skin, ben, ben Ginsburg. Ginsburg. Yeah, Bob Bauer and Ben Ginsburg, who, you know, Bauer's the first Democrat. Any Democrat would hire Ben as the first Republican. Any Republican would hire an election dispute. Uh, and they chaired this commission and they proposed, and, and it's a whole lot of really practical election administration ideas. The one that I think we should shout from the rooftops is no one should have to wait more than a half hour to vote. Uh, and I think so many reforms stem from that, that uh, you know, we should have mail ballots I, I'm very happy, and, and drop boxes. I cast my 2020 ballot in a drop box in front of Walt Whitman High School, which I love because my kids went there and because he's the poet of democracy. <laughs> uh, but we should have all those options. But if you're going to get in line on election day, you shouldn't have to wait longer than half an hour. And if you did all the reforms required to make that happen, <clears throat> this would be a much better experience for everybody. And that means making sure machines are well distributed through a given jurisdiction and all sorts of other, that there are enough polling places. Um, but boy, I wish we could just elevate that no more than a half an hour to vote. You know, I'll just, just to make an, another quick point on this, which is it is obvious that if you overlaid a requirement to vote on a completely dysfunctional and resistant election system underneath it, 
you're going to, it's going to be a big problem. So that's why we uh, very strongly support the various reforms to make the system as welcoming and as uh, inclusive as possible. But we also, but, but, and, but we, we reject the argument that, well, let's do those things first. Why are you raising the idea of universal voting? Because I think what we want to do is put a North Star out there that what, uh, what we really are aspiring to is absolutely full participation of everyone. And then the reforms that we're doing that, that make voting uh, you know, easier and more convenient have an end goal as well. So we see these as complementary and uh, um, you know, and synchronous, not, uh, not contradictory. Which allows yeah. me in good book promotion fashion to say that that's why we call the book 100% democracy. <laughs> Well, you know, I'll say that was that was my kind of uh, approach going into the book. I was like, well, there's all these things. How do you know the initial skeptic? And like you had me by the end. I was like, I like the big swing. I like the idea that you sort of put a you know, assert your argument out there and then kind of expect that the norms follow from this large change. Like, I like the boldness of it. Um, and thank you. <laughs> and, you know, because. I think a skeptic, you know, could read it and go, well, we can't even get election day off of work. Like the, you know, sort of all, all of the, all of the barriers that we think about in trying to universalize or, inc you know, include more people in the democratic process. But instead, if we just kind of invert the problems and we start with the assertion, then, then we have the incentive or the, at least kind of the ground rules and to make those changes to comply with that new Assertion to comply with that new rule. I kind of like the the full force of the argument there. Um, Could I say I really appreciate that for another reason? Oh. Uh, but just the kindness of it is great, and we, oh. we are uh, uh, gratified. You. But we really tried in the book to answer as best we could what we saw as inevitable and legitimate um, skepticism uh, critiques or skepticism skepticism about this idea and. Uh, that's what we try to do, because we know we're advancing an idea where we need to persuade uh, people because it is a new idea uh, for the United States, though it's well-tested idea elsewhere. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it made me think about, uh, I think, a concern that you, you discussed early on, but um, I think a lot of people might have this worry when they read it, and it's the worry about the uninformed voter. Not in the sense that you discuss in the book, which is like the literacy tests of the early 20th century and how we think about being informed with being educated. We're talking, what I'm talking about is people that don't have preferences about the water board, who sits on the water board commission, people that don't have you know, any understanding about who the candidates are for the local board of education, but they find themselves in the, in the polling booth. So one of the options that you mentioned is they can spoil their ballot, they can vote blank, they can write in Alfred E. Newman, whatever they want. But then you're going to get a certain percentage of people that votes by random, right? That you're going to insert this kind of random feature. I like his name or he is first on the ballot, right? Or you're moving efficiently or they're reading party platforms, right? And so like, is this a worry for you that you introduce kind of uninformed but highly incentivized participants? Miles, why don't you go first? Uh, uh, I also don't know who to vote for for the water board or the comptroller. Well, well, that's so this is part the of the point. Miles made this point in a conversation we had. I, that's why I want him to go first, because that's exactly correct. Go ahead, Miles. And I'm highly informed. I'd like to consider myself highly informed. <laughs> Miles. Well, it, it, you know, it is the case that, uh, you know, there, that and, and, you know, the, the, the evidence or the history is that if you are actually, go, you know, you are going to have to make the choice. You will spend some time educating yourself, you know, to the fact that, um, you know, who who are the candidates for board of education? I don't know about water board. I don't, I'm not going as far as water boards, but for board of education, this affects your children. This affects the quality of your of your schools. You should care about it. The fact that there are 15% people voting for a board of education election, I think that's a real problem. Um, and so. Uh, I think it's important, but I also think that the 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 um, identification of more motivated voters with more informed voters is a false is a false equation. We have many many voters who are very forcefully uh, motivated, um, you know, by 
being part of one one party or another or one you know faction or another uh, who are going to the polls. It doesn't make them educated voters. And the fact that people don't vote, there can be many, many, many reasons for it. We should not assume it's because they are uneducated. I think it's a fundamentally de- undemocratic argument too, which is we want a smaller electorate of more informed and more intelligent people and they'll make better decisions. No, I don't think that's the case. Uh, and I think both EJ and I are genuine small D Democrats and believing that if you actually have everyone participating and you actually have a system that bends itself towards making it both possible and, and good to do, uh, we'll get better results. Over, over time, we'll get better results as well. By the so way, no, Miles Davis my, my just fell off my wall the because he, he was outraged at the idea of the uninformed voter, I think. So I apologize for the crash. I need a new hook up there. Um, <laughs> let me, I, I just want to underscore, uh, there, it, there's no evidence that every voter is as informed in the actual electorate as that this electorate is more or less informed than a universal electorate would be, number one. Number two, I am a, such a small D Democrat that I deeply object to the so-called ignorant voters argument. What we found actually is a lot of the people who are critical of our idea don't much like the existing electorate either uh, and talk about how uninformed this electorate is. Um, but I think there's a lot of social science evidence on the side of those of us who are small D Democrats all the way down. Um, you know, V.O. Key's famous book, The Responsible Electorate, Sam Popkin's uh, great book, The Reasoning Voter. Uh, I love the first sentence of V.O. Key's book, which we quote in our book, the perverse and unorthodox argument of this little book is that voters are not fools. And that's what Miles and I believe. And we think that a universal electorate would be not be an electorate of fools, but an electorate of citizens who care about their republic. I think on that note, and as Rick has turned his camera back on, I think that's a great way to end it, right? Thank you. Well, um, I've now given up my plans to run for the local water board, since I don't think I can count on Sarah's vote. Uh, I want to thank you all. This is a great discussion. Sarah, you asked some fantastic questions. And um, uh, if you weren't already thinking of buying uh, 100% democracy, uh, now this conversation should convince you that it is worth your time. You might not agree, but it will give you things that you will think about. Uh, thank you to EJ. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Sarah. I also want to thank Rabi Kadri of the UCI Law Centers for uh, the technical support, as well as Colleen Terracani. Thank you all from the UCI Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. This uh, webinar will be posted and you'll be able to watch it again. So and Rick and thank Sarah, you all. thank you very much for having thank us. You. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience out there, including my old classmate. <laughs> Good luck with your book. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.